Hey guys, Nathan here, Absurd Being. Let's get into Kierkegaard 5, Communication. So the diagram, um, we're still in that subjective, objective part of the diagram. Um, so the communication that we, we look at, we'll, we'll um, investigate or analyze subjective communication as opposed to objective communication. And we'll also look at the role that the teacher plays. Kierkegaard talks a little bit about what the what um, how the teacher should interact with the learner and and, and what um, and what it means to be a teacher and we'll look at that in some detail as well. Okay, so it's objective and subjective communication. <clears throat> For the objective, I actually only have one one sentence. Objective communication is immediate and direct. That's the take-home message here. So when, whenever we're, we're um, aiming to communicate um, something that's objective in nature, something that's not doesn't have that inwardness, that that the uh, it's not about becoming subjective, but it's just about external things. It's world historical or it's it's um, aesthetic or something that. Knowledge, knowledge or information like that can be communicated directly and immediately. And um, the, the, the idea here is that it doesn't have that double reflection. Because it doesn't have that double reflection, it can just go straight to imparting the, um, or, or the teacher, I guess, can go straight to imparting whatever it is, that whatever knowledge or facts or whatever it is one is trying to... to communicate. Remember that double reflection there the that was was particular to subjectivity because and the double reflection was just briefly um, that you think the universal but that that universal idea must then be um, enacted in a lived specific individual. So you've got that the, the the movement there from that that universal idea into a lived actuality, and the objective didn't have that. It doesn't have that. It's just concerned with the external, with the world historical, with the aesthetic. So that's why objective communication can just be direct. Subjective communication, on the other hand, can't be direct because if it was if it was simply direct, it would pass over the inward aspect of subjectivity. It would pass over the inwardness, which, which I've talked about, probably ad nauseum. Um, and, uh, and that inward aspect is precisely that double reflection, where it's not enough to, to just convey the idea. You also have to get the individual, get the learner, the person you're communicating to, to live it. They have to experience it. They have to they take that idea and actually make, um, through action, they have to take it and, and live the idea rather than just come to an understanding or, or know the idea. So it's not direct. <clears throat> um, and the focus of of subjective communication is on the the successful transmission of subjectivity so again there it's not it's not about um coming to understand the idea or intellectually grasping something it's about becoming subjective it's about getting the 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 listener or the reader to become subjective themselves and you can't do that with a direct transmission. So the, uh, we're trying to transmit subjectivity. Um, oh, that, and that, that harkens back to the last video too, the, where we talked about understanding not the saying, but the individual in the saying. Uh, and that, we talked about that there about self-consciousness. It's not enough to understand um, that kind of the, the objective, the superficial 
elements of anything, but rather you have to understand the individual. Everything will, will come back to the individual. That's what this deeper understanding of inwardness meant. So the essential thing here for Kierkegaard when we're talking about subject of communication is appropriation. He uses that word appropriation. So the focus is not on the, the content, but it's on the the receiver, the, the reader, the listener, because they are the goal of subject of communication is not to impart something, some information. The goal is to transform the the recipient to have them become subjective. Um, and I've got a, a quote which kind of captures the, the difference between these two forms of communication. The ordinary communication, object of thinking, has no secrets. It is only with double reflective, sorry, double reflected subjective thinking that secrets arise, i.e. all of its essential content is essentially secrecy because it cannot be imparted directly. The knowledge in question is not to be said directly because the essential thing with the knowledge is the appropriation. So really just, just um, summarizing what I've said, the ordinary object of communication has no secrets. Um, the, the content of the double reflective subject of thinking is secrecy, is essentially secrecy because it cannot be imparted directly. That's the important, important line there. Um, this idea we talked about the goal of um, subject of communication is appropriation. So the focus is on the receiver and, and about making them or allowing them to become subjective, transforming them in some way. But we can't do that directly. Right? You can't just transform someone directly. So it has to be done indirectly. So the 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 value of the of the message of the content isn't in the content, it's in what the content will do to the listener or to the receiver, how it will evoke certain um, thoughts or um, certain ideas in the in the receiver. Um, so the knowledge in question can't be said directly because the essential thing is the preparation of what I just said. Uh, so the the focus that I wanted to draw your attention to is that that element of hiddenness or deception again. So that that's coming back here, and um, be, and this all ties back to the fact that subjectivity, becoming subjective, is inward. It's not available to anybody else. So if you're trying to impart that, if you're trying to impart subjectivity, not just objective information, um, by necessity, your communication will, will have to be, the, the essential part of your communication will have to be hidden because what you're trying to deliver, what you're trying to achieve with the communication is appropriation in the, in the receiver. So often that will involve active deception, not just um, Kind of having having something hidden in your in your content, the whatever it is that will allow the the reader or the listener to become subjective themselves, but it will involve active deception to evoke whatever it is you want to evoke in the recipient. So, um, sub, uh, Kierkegaard says subjectivity is communicated then by works of art. So for him, works of art is is kind of a term which captures the way that the author or the, the painter or whoever, the creator, um, tries to impart that subjectivity, tries to evoke or um, bring the, the, the reader or the listener or the, the, uh, the onlooker to um, subjectivity in themselves. So that's interesting, this idea of works of art, picked up by 
Heidegger as well. Um, and this also explains exactly why Kierkegaard wrote with pseudonyms, right? He was deliberately trying to get away from this direct, I'm the author, I've got something to teach you, here it is. And you read it and learn and intellectualize and, and understand whatever he's saying. The pseudonyms kind of twist everything. It's not from Kierkegaard now, it's from this guy. And this guy has a history of his own. And uh, and then he's not even the author, he collated everything. But actually the author is this guy who we don't even know, we don't even have a name for him. You know, so it, the authorship is, is, is all hidden and tangled, it's a tangled mess. Um, but that's because that's not important. That's it's not it's not about a a teacher with a message. It's about letting the um, the, the content have some effect on the reader. Um, and it's also why Kierkegaard wrote a lot of his works in kind of pseudo fiction. You know, stages on life's way. That's that's all fiction. Either or is all fiction. Um, repetition was all fiction, or a lot of it was fiction. Actually, it was all fiction. Uh, it's a fictional story in the first part as well. But, um, and so we, we get to see, when we're not reading like a, an, an academic treatise, we're reading a story about a person. And through that person's eyes, we can experience what they're going through. And so it, it's more this... <clears throat> We're 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 getting getting the picture that Kikia wants to transmit, but indirectly through um, through through the experiences of the person we're reading about. So that that's interesting to note. That's why Kikia did that. Um, and now, so that's the difference between objective and subjective communication. Let's move into the teacher. So when it comes to the teacher, um, one of the one of the biggest, the most important points for Kierkegaard is that you ought to avoid making a direct relationship with the with the learner, um, because if you have that direct relationship, teacher student, then the learner isn't changed inwardly, but externally. So the relationship with the learner then becomes, um, well, the relationship then is with the learner. Sorry, the relationship if with the learner is then with the teacher. And that's not the relationship that, that we're interested in, in appropriation. Appropri in appropriation, the learner is, if you like, in a relationship with him or herself. It's internal, it's inward. It's about becoming subjective, not about forming an external relationship with anybody else or anything else. So um, if, if this, this teacher-student or teacher-learner relationship is too direct, then what happens is that the, the learner doesn't appropriate the information, doesn't, doesn't take it in and, and doesn't become whatever it is that the information is about, that the information is imparting. It doesn't have that subjective impact that we're aiming for. And so interestingly enough, he talks about Socrates here <clears throat> and uh, the way that it was, it was a benefit for Socrates, and this is why Socrates was never... Um, uh, never kind of ashamed of his his famed ugliness he was he was infamously he was famously ugly and um that helped him Kierkegaard says because it let it let him maintain this distance the, the students weren't engaged and in, in, they didn't want to have a direct relationship with him he was so ugly but that's fine that that made him a better teacher because then the information had the desired effect of, of going to work on the students. They could they could 
take in the information without getting distracted by this external authority figure. Um, and it was also why he recommended, Socrates that is, recommended the that indirect teaching method, the Socratic method of kind of question and answer, where he didn't, he wouldn't tell you the answer, but he would ask questions to um, elicit the answer from you. So that's another example of, of this indirect method of teaching, method of communication. And since it's Kierkegaard, he always has to bring it back to religion. So God, it turns out, is in, in being hidden, being mysterious, is actually the ultimate teacher, right? That's if God were to just reveal himself before us, then um, we, we form a relationship with him rather than with ourselves. It, it, we, we lose that, um, that inward focus, or, which is the focus of all um, subjective communication. So, it, you know, the, the criticism often directed to a religion is, where is God? Why? He, he works in mysterious ways, right? But what does that mean? I mean, what kind of God would do that? Well, apparently, for Kierkegaard, a good God, a, uh, a good teacher, a God who's a good teacher. So, I don't know. Take from that what you will. I just I thought I'd throw it in there because it's, it's important to Kierkegaard. But again, like the, the, all of this stuff is um, subjective, objective, this, this talk of, of communication, subjective uh, and the object of distinction therein. Um, this is all secular as far as I'm concerned. None of this necessarily takes us back to religion, which is why it's so good, which is why it's, um, this is all great stuff. So to communicate actuality, communicate subjectivity it must be done in such a way that the student understands it as possibility so if it's going to to have uh, the the inward effect that we that we hope if it's going to be appropriated by the re receiver of the information then the student has to understand it as possibility So what he's saying is that we can't say that we shouldn't, as, as the teacher, we shouldn't say um, this is the idea, this is, this is the, the thing I'm trying to teach, I'm trying to convey to you, this is the content, and it's been done by this person. It's actually been done here in this example and in this example and at this time. Because if we give concrete examples, it no longer has the the um, the feel of a possibility for the receiver for the learner now it's more like um, something external to them it's something that it, it's again it's something that the, that the learner learns rather than appropriates rather than takes in to him or herself to be lived um, so he doesn't recommend this he's against the idea of Everything needs a proof. Everything needs an instance or an exemplar. Um, and, and we shouldn't do that because it, it robs whatever it is, the content of its lived possibility for the student. And that's the whole point of subjective communication. Um, so there are two reasons he gives, despite the fact that I've just rattled off Whatever, whatever I've said about that. Two reasons why we shouldn't um, give examples, concrete examples like that. First of all, true actuality being inward is invisible. So um, even if someone had actually achieved whatever it is that, that we're trying to impart, someone had done whatever we're talking about, whatever content it is, um, then we wouldn't know it. So it would, be, it would be useless giving the example, you know. If I'm trying to, to say that, if I'm talking about X and I say, this person has done X, look at this guy, look at, study, study him or her. This is, this is how being, having accomplished X looks like. This is what having accomplished X looks like. Um, it wouldn't look any different from someone who hasn't accomplished X. 
because true inwardness is inter it's well true subjectivity is inward right it's not um it's not something that's visible on the outside that's what we talked about in the last video true actuality is invisible so it wouldn't help to give an example and the other reason is that a person who's actually done it the the example that you give then becomes for the student a rare exception um, so it becomes if you give an example rather than motivating them and keeping keeping the possibility alive for them it becomes more like um, ah someone's done it and this is what it looks like but they are they're, they're the kind of they're the exception. They're, they're exceptionally talented or they, they were exceptionally lucky to have whatever it was that they had. So they become kind of, they, they get raised up on a pedestal. And, um, and the idea that that's to be lived in the, in the message is no longer a live possibility for the student. It's not a, it's not a call to the student. It doesn't place a demand on the student that they enact this material. And this quote, which is quite long, captures this. Whatever is great in terms of the universal must therefore not be presented as something to be admired, but as a requirement. In the form of possibility, the presentation becomes a demand. This brings home to the reader as nearly as possible the question of whether he wants to exist in it. Possibility operates with the ideal human being, understood in terms not of difference but of the universal, which relates to each human being as a requirement. The more one points to it, sorry, the more one points to it being this particular human being, the easier it, it becomes for the others to treat him as exempt. Ethically speaking, there is nothing one sleeps so soundly on as admiration over an actuality. And ethically speaking, if, anyone, if anything can rouse a person, it is possibility, when it requires itself ideally of a human being. So, I mean, that whole thing is really just, just captures that idea that... Um, the idea that we're, 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 we, we want to transmit to the student, to the learner, um, should not be um, exemplified. We shouldn't give examples or, or um, yeah, we shouldn't give examples because uh, it has to remain a live possibility. Doing so discourages that for the learner. Okay, um, so kind of coming to the end slowly, slowly. Uh, there's another little section I want to look at here. So everything I've just talked about was from um, the postscript, if you're interested. And uh, I think it was all from, or most of it was from a couple of pages. No, it's from, I've, I've pulled things from all over. So um, anyway, that's the postscript. But I want to just switch to stages on life's way for a little bit. Um, and this section kind of fits in here. It's a quote. I did want to include it. I'm not sure if I should have put it in here or in the last video, but I'm going to throw it in here. It kind of fits a little bit. Um, and the broader idea is that spirit cannot be verified or validated by the historical. So we're using different terms. It's a different book, um, but still talking about the subjectivity, even though Kierkegaard talks about spirit here. It's the same idea, becoming inward, uh, sorry, becoming subjective, inwardness. Um, and how it, the, the historical has no hold over um, such a process. So the objective has no role to play in the subjective. So the quote is, it is spirit to ask about two things. One, is what is being said possible? Two, am I able to do it? But it is a lack of spirit to ask about two things. One, did it actually happen? Two, has my neighbor Christofferson done it? Has he actually done it? 
I like that. I like that reference to Christofferson. I, I want to use that somewhere in some Christo. So I guess maybe this is like the Danish Jones or Smith or something. But I like that. Has my neighbour Christofferson done it? Uh, so anyway, it's 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 subjective to have these two things pop up. Is it possible? And am I able to do it? So it's it's all about the individual. It's all about the individual appropriating, taking that that content of the of the um, the communication and running with it themselves. But it's a lack of spirit to ask, did it happen? And has anyone else done it? Has someone done it? Who? What were they like? When did they do it? These are all objective facts that have no bearing on subjectivity. Um, so now. I've got a couple of, only a couple of things left, but uh, the, the first one is, well, we've, we've already talked about this, but I just want to emphasize it a little bit, the, the fact that deception is actually a virtue. Deception is something good here for Kierkegaard. Um, and that the reason I, I emphasize it is because it's, it goes contrary to everything we typically believe about deception, right? And in Stages on Life's Way, the diary writer in the third section, Guilty Not Guilty, talks about the dangers of teaching and the value of deception. And I'm just going to um, give you the whole quote. It's, it's another long one, but um, I'll give it to you, then we'll have a quick look at it um, in a bit more detail. So I have reached the conclusion that I benefit a person most by deceiving him. The highest truth with respect to my relation to him is this. Essentially, I can be of no benefit to him. And the most adequate form for this truth is that I deceive him. For otherwise, it would be possible for him to make a mistake and learn the truth from me and thereby be deceived. Namely, that he would believe that he had learned it from me. Even if the wisest of persons spent six hours a day on someone, even if he spent six other hours considering how best to do it, if he continued in this for six years, he would be a deceiver if he dared to say that he had benefited him essentially. A person can teach language, the arts, manual skills, etc. to another, but ethically, religiously, one cannot essentially benefit another. And this is why it is beautiful and inspiring to express this in the utmost exertion of the deception. So, I mean, that, that basically, I don't think there's anything particularly new in that quote, but it's nice just to, for me, I, I just wanna, I want to, I always want to put these things in quotes for you so you can see, um, you know, you don't just have to take my word for it. And, and I always quote extensively when I write my summaries because for the same reason, I don't want to take my word for it. I want to know exactly what the, the author said so I don't, um, misrepresent them and, and run the risk of misinterpreting so anyway same thing for you uh, that's the quote everything we've talked about already really um, deception is is uh, well actually we, we kind of haven't talked about this that much <clears throat> but again it's related to the teacher the teacher doesn't benefit the learner directly it's not about the focus is not about the teacher the focus is about the focus is on the the receiver, the learner, <clears throat> and no teacher benefits a student essentially, because the only person who can benefit a, a student essentially is the student, right? That's that's the whole point of subjectivity. It's inward. It's it's about the student um, understanding and taking on board these ideas and then living them. That's the double reflection. So it all comes back to that. And the only person who can do that is the student. And he, he does say as well there that ethically, religiously, one cannot benefit another. So that, that's the important distinction. Ethically, religiously, this is the same kind of thing as, as subjectivity, subject, subjectively. Um, or actually, one cannot essentially benefit another. Ultimately, they <clears throat> they have to appropriate the, the knowledge themselves, and so in in imparting wisdom or teaching anything, um, it 
it's necessarily if, if you're imparting something subjective something ethically religious if it's something actual it, it necessarily is a deception there's no way around that because you can't you can't teach um, you can't make someone become something you know you can't make them become subjective so when you're teaching that you can't directly teach it obviously because it just can't be done so necessarily if that's your goal it, there must be deception going on but Kikigo goes even a step beyond that I think and says that um, it's active deception is, is also beneficial because you are um, you're trying to elicit you're trying to evoke something in the in the receiver in the learner and so in that sense as well deceptions a virtue um, interesting to compare that idea with with Nietzsche as well who talked about deception being um, of value for slightly different reasons I guess but um, but it's interesting to see that those two thinkers, both considered existentialists, both have this idea, this this um, this belief about deception. Um, and finally, there is one exception though that that Kierkegaard raises, uh, and he brings this up in the. Um, The sickness unto death. Now I always have trouble pulling names when I'm on the spot. Anyway, the sickness unto death. Uh, there's there's one exception to this. So first of all, he talks about the the way that for great for the Greeks, learning was re recollection. Um, and this is this is that. It's the Platonic idea actually that, or learning is recollection. So, you, you never teach something that the student doesn't already know I and mean, this is tied in with Plato's idea of, of the soul and, and you know we um, before we're born we, we we had perfect knowledge of the forms and then once once we, we become human we lose that perfect knowledge but it's 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 there still and when we when we learn something we're not learning something afresh we're remembering what we used to know before we were born so this idea that learning was recollection <clears throat> meant that every teacher was basically insignificant. Every teacher was was really just the um, prompting, if you like, of for the student to remember this information for themselves. Um, so that the truth was in us already. And this corresponds quite nicely with Kierkegaard's position that that the learner must discover the truth. For him or herself, or it's not quite the way that, that we would put it for Kierkegaard, but there's a parallel there, right? The teacher is less important. The focus is on the on the of the student or on the learner. Um, but there is a is a but with this. For Christianity, is different. The teacher is essential. And that's because, well, and the teacher is God or Jesus. And he is essential because the object of faith is not the teaching, but the teacher. So take from that what you will. Has, has Kierkegaard shot himself in the foot with that? I mean, ultimately, he's trying to, to marry this his, his ideas with Christianity. So he has to get Christianity to align, right? Um, and and he does that here by saying that, well, when it comes to Christianity, actually Christianity is the one exception to this rule, and it's the one exception because we're talking about God no longer. We're no longer talking about an ordinary human teacher, and when it comes to God, what's important is the God relationship, not not the content. Uh, yeah, not the content so much, not the teaching, and the or the teaching changing the the um, well the teaching does still change the the the, the learner, 
but it changes the learner in a way that that brings the the direct relationship to the teacher to light so i guess he's not really shooting himself in the foot but he is um he is bending a little bit to to get christianity christianity to kind of conform with with his um his this whole idea of his of the subject of an object of communication so anyway i mean i just i threw that in there again like just there's it's so important for Kierkegaard. I think it's important that I that I mention um, religion where it's appropriate, even though this this whole video basically is secular as far as I'm concerned. And this this idea of subjective and objective, it's gold. It's 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 really good stuff. Um, so let's have a look at the summary. So we've got there. Uh, we looked at communication, objective communication, which was immediate and and direct um, subject of communication which was indirect involved deception and the focus was on appropriation and remember the, the reason that the subject was indirect was because it had that double reflection it incorporated that double reflection uh, then we looked at the teacher and the way that the teacher should avoid direct a direct relationship with the learner. It shouldn't be about the teacher. It should be about the the, the student. Um, and this was is to no examples. Don't give any examples in your in your teaching, so that you preserve possibility for the students. So that it, it, it remains a live um, possibility for them. And we also talked about the way that deception is a virtue. The Kierkegaard values deception ultimately. Ultimately, it's 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 necessary with subjectivity, but it's also um, that the teacher can also deliberately include this in order to 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 carry the student to where he or she needs to be which is what Kierkegaard does with all of his, his writings. And so that is where we uh, where I'm going to finish up this video. So thanks for listening to that. I hope that, that clarifies some stuff. Next video we will look at probably one of the, probably the most controversial thing Kierkegaard says, subjectivity is truth, um, and we'll, we'll look at what that means. So thanks for listening, and I'll catch you next next time around.